Keisha Johnny's a proud member of Christian Faith Fellowship Church, where we are on a mission to share God's love everywhere we go. We accomplish this by proclaiming the word of God, uplifting the family, and positively affecting the community. I just want to take a moment to thank you so much for watching. Be sure to like, share, and subscribe. God bless. Okay, let's, go to, let's go to Ephesians chapter 2, verse 19. It says, now, therefore, you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and the members of the household of God. Everybody say, we are family. We are family. We are, family. We are a part of the family and the household of God. It's important that you remember that as we go to our next text. Let's go over to Romans chapter 15. Romans chapter 15. We'll start at verse 1. We're going to do a little reading. We're going to go down to verse 7. We then who are strong ought to bear with the scruples or the infirmities of the weak and not to please ourselves. Let each of us please his neighbor for his good, leading to edification. For even Christ did not please himself, but it is written, The reproaches of those who reproached you fell upon me, or the insults of those who insulted you fell upon me. For whatever things were written before were written for our learning, that we through the patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. Now we now may the God of patience and comfort grant you to be like-minded toward one another according to Je Christ Jesus, that you may be with one mind and one mouth, that you may with one mind and one mouth glorify God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore receive one another just as Christ also received us to the what? To the glory of God. To the glory of God. From these passages of scripture, I want to represent a message entitled, Just Bear With Me. Just Bear With Me. Look at your neighbor. I'm going to stop saying look at your neighbor. I know this is not a look at your neighbor generation. This is my last time saying it, maybe. <laughs> Just look at your neighbor one more time. Say, neighbor. Just bear with me. We are family because we are family. Just bear with me because we are family. Christian faith, Bishop has declared it, and I speak it as well over this ministry, that Christian faith is we are in a season of growth. And God is about to begin to grow this ministry numerically. And the people who are going to come through those doors are not going to necessarily be churched. They're not going to have a lot of history of, of how things are done in church. They're not going to be familiar with the tradition of church, with the religious aspect of church. There is a season coming at Christian faith where there are going to be a large amount of young people, not just in age, but also in the faith who may not know much about the faith, but all they know is that they found this Jesus. Help me, Holy Spirit. I, I've learned about this Jesus. I don't know much about how y'all dance and shout, and I don't know much. All I know is that I want to know the more of this Jesus. And so I want us, I feel in my spirit that we just need to be prepared for this influx of people who are coming in because we don't want to be in a position where we turn people away because because of maybe because of the lack of maturity in them or the lack of strength in the faith we want to receive them we live in a generation now where the message is it's becoming more and more individualistic the message is becoming more and more self-centered. 
not selfish, but self-centered. It's, it's more about what God can do for me. It's more about finding a church that will make me more comfortable. I need to find a convenient church with a pastor that I like, with a good praise and worship team, a good children's ministry. I need to find a church where that, that can help my teenager grow. And these things are beautiful and fantastic, but we also have to keep in mind, I need to find a church where I can help, where I can not only be served, but where I can find a place to serve. Okay? We live in this generation of where, where the message is becoming more and more individualistic. I'm a little concerned because the cutting people off message is becoming more and more popular. If you can't grow with me, then you can't go with me. I, why not? Sometimes, you know, you know, we hear it all the time. Sometimes God will allow, well, God will cause people to be removed from your life because you have a call on your life. You're going places and, and not everybody can go with you. And I, I get that. I understand that. But if I can just bring just a different aspect to that, I'm not, I'm not disagreeing with it. I'm just trying to bring the other side of that mountain to it. it of course, there are some times where God will allow people to exit your life. Now, of course, there are some times where you can't take people that are not growing with you. But help me. Let me help you understand. That is not the goal. Cutting people out of your life is not the goal. It's not God's first mind concerning us. Okay? It's so important that we understand that we have to be patient with each other. We have to be patient even with those who are not necessarily adding to us right now. Because you can't, you help me hold this spirit. You can't be so quick to remove people out of your life because they're not adding to you right now. Because if you move and make rash decisions concerning the relationships in your life, then you will cause yourself to miss out on what God has for you through that person. They may not be adding to you now, but I promise you, there's some promotion attached to them. There's some wealth attached to them. There's some opportunities attached to them that you may not necessarily see first. So before you cut them off, all I'm asking is that you go back to God, get on your knees, and you pray about it first. Because we have to be patient with each other. Why? 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 Because God is all about relationship. That's what this entire walk is all about. That's what this whole thing is all about. It's all about relationship. God sent his son. God gave his son, and his son gave his life for the sake of relationship. God wants, more, God wants nothing more in this world than to have relationship with you. And he will go to the greatest lengths to get relationship with you. God wants relationship. He wants connection. He wants intimacy. He wants to, he wants to speak to you. He wants you to speak to him. He wants to share with you his mind and his heart. He wants to share with you his comfort and his peace. He wants to be with you. You remember the scripture says that they will come to Christ in the end times and say, didn't we not, did we not, uh, didn't we not uh, 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 cast out demons in your name? Didn't we not do these great works in your name? And Jesus said, oh, help me, help. depart from me, you workers of iniquity, because I never knew you. I was never intimate with you. I never had closeness and connection with you. You never took the time to know me. Of course you cast out demons in my name because my name has power. But there was no connection with me. There was no intimacy with me. I, that's all I want is relationship. 
is so important to God. You see throughout the Old Testament, the, the people of God, the Israelites sinning and falling into sin constantly over and over and over again. And God continued to forgive them over and over and over again because even though they were an imperfect people, all God wanted was relationship. All he wanted was relationship. Do you not understand that God forgave us for the, for the fact, for the simple fact for reconciliation so that he could recover and restore relationship? Many of us have forgotten the beauty in forgiveness. Oh, help me, Holy Spirit. We forgive for so many reasons. We forgive to make ourselves feel better. We forgive to relieve ourselves of that burden of bitterness. We forgive so that God can forgive us. But when is the last time we've forgiven for the sake of reconciling a relationship? That is the beauty of forgiveness. That is why God wants us to forgive each other because he knows that we need each other. God has given me himself and you for my success. Let me say that again. All I have is God and you. I can't function without either one of them. I need you. Don't be so quick to kick me out of your life because I'm not perfect. Don't be so quick to kick me out of your life because I'm not as mature as you or I'm not as deep as you or I'm not as studied as you or I don't have the discipline that you have. Just bear with me for a second, if you will, please. Because I need you. I need you. Thank you, Jesus. So we have to bear with each other. We have to bear with each other because I need you. I know it's simple, but I want us to be prepared for where God is taking us. Let's go to Romans chapter 15. I won't be before you very long. There are a few points, maybe three points that I want to pull from this, and we'll be out of your way. We then who are strong ought to bear with the scruples of the weak and not to please ourselves. In, in chapter 14, the, the chapter before this, Paul begins the conversation of receiving the weak in the faith. Receive the weak in the faith and bear with them. They think a certain way because they're immature. They think a certain way because they're not learned. So because they're immature and they may not know the scriptures like you, don't, don't dispute with them. Don't argue. There's two things that you can't do with the weak in the faith. Don't dispute with them and don't condemn them, but receive them. Help me, Holy Spirit. He says, because I understand that they're not knowledgeable. They still think that certain foods are a sin. They still think that you got to observe certain days. I get it. They still think that you ain't supposed to be eating that stuff, that you're going to hell because you're still eating that stuff. But, but don't dispute them because you don't want to be an offense. And so if, they're, if they think that it's wrong, don't eat it in front of them. <laughs> you can live without that just for one meal. <laughs> Help me, Holy Spirit. Because you don't want to be a stumbling block or an offense. They said you don't want, Paul said you don't want to destroy the work of God over some food. If they think that eating chicken is wrong, just, just go home and fry you some chicken. It's not that big of a deal. He says, stop disputing over doubtful things. Why are you disputing over things that don't matter? Why are you disputing over things that aren't an issue? Just work on loving each other and embracing each other and talking through it. You don't have to dispute and argue. I'm so tired. Oh, Lord, forgive me. I don't like when we use the word of God to bring dissension among each other. 
The word of God is not there. I'm moving too fast. The word of God is not for us to bring distinction and to bring division amongst ourselves. The word of God is there for to, to teach us and to train us, but more importantly, to bring us together. So he says, stop arguing over the word. Stop arguing over scriptures, uh, over the little things concerning scripture. We all know that it's not about what you eat, but it's all about the work of the Holy Spirit on the inside of you. We understand that. But do not condemn them. Do not judge them because one day you're going to have to answer for yourself. You're too busy judging and condemning the weak person. And the whole time God is saying, what about you? Because you're going to answer to me. You're going to have to have an answer for what you've done. Right? So he says, so he says instead of judging them, instead of disputing with them, he says, bear with them. Now notice what the Bible says. It says, bear with the infirmities of the weak. That word weak in the Greek also means sick. When you see Jesus healing the sick, it's the same Greek word for weak. When you see the Bible saying, when you see the sick, send them to the elders and have them pray for them. That also means weak. Because our infirmities or these viruses or these illnesses or these diseases come to make us weak. What do I mean by that? Temptation is an infirmity. It's a virus. It's a sickness. It's a disease. Disappointment is a sickness. It's a disease. Frustration. It's a, it's, it's a disease. It comes to make you weak. Just as if a virus in your body comes and makes you weak. All of these things take our strength from us. Depression, anxiety, pain, hurt, heartbrokenness, frustration, sickness. It comes and makes us weak. Let me help you with this. Either you have infirmities or you will have infirmities. Don't sit here and act like you've never been through anything that caused you to be weak. I know you've gone through it because it's the human experience. And so don't, don't be so far away from your sickness until you are so far removed from me. You may not have been weak in years, but I'm struggling now. Help me, Holy Spirit. Don't go so far away. Don't let your weaknesses, your days of being weak, so, be so far in your past that it causes you to have a, a, a wall between me and you because of my weakness. You still going through that? Yes! You still struggling? Yes! And I'm coming to you. Help me, Holy Spirit. I feel your presence. And I'm coming to you not for your judgments. I'm coming to you not for your, uh, I'm coming to you not, not for you to condemn me and look down on me. I'm coming to you because I need your help. I don't know how to deal with this. I don't know how to go through this. And I know you've gone through it before. Why are you looking at me like that? Why are you talking to me like this? I'm sick. I'm sick. I'm in pain. I'm diseased. I have a virus. What do we do to those who are physically sick? How do we treat those who are physically sick? We care for them. Now, why can't we do that for those who are spiritually sick? That's more important. So he says, bear with. I need my illustration. He says, bear with them. Bear with them. Well, well, I have this anointing on my life. I'm going places in God. I don't have time for this. Well, if the person you needed felt that way, where would you be? If the person you needed didn't have time for you, where would you be? 
I need somebody who can play a weak person. Pastor Richard, can you play a weak person? Pastor Richard is not weak at all. Look at him. That's a sturdy man right there. <laughs> he going to give me back too. So when the Bible says bear with, what it really means, let me, let me say this. We think, we think bear with means this, that I'm going to watch him carry, act like it's heavy. I'm going to watch him carry that burden. But I'm going to be patient with him as I watch him carry it. He can come with me, but I'm, not, but I'm about tired of him. But I'm going to be patient. Walk with me. Yeah, okay. Come on, man. All right, I get it. I know you've been going through a lot. I, I get it. Okay. I know. I know you're going through this divorce. I get it. But hurry up, please. Come on, man. Come on. I, I know you've been fired from your job. I get it. I know that you got debt. I know that you don't have enough money in your pocket and you don't know what to do. Your family is falling apart. I get it. But come on, hurry. Come on. I'm going places. I'm anointed. Come on. Come on. God has greatness for my future, and I can't carry no baggage. You got to hurry up. See, see, I'm going to bear with you, but you got about a couple more days. Am I telling the truth? So the Bible says when it says bear with, we think of just watching people and walking with them. But the scripture, that word literally means not just to bear with, but it means to bear up. Ah, help me, Holy Ghost. I'm not going to sit here and watch you go through what you're going through. I'm going to bear up your infirmities with you. And I'm going to act like it's my sickness. I'm going to act like I just lost my job. I'm going to act like my family is falling apart. I'm going to act like I'm struggling and broke. I'm going to act like it's my temptation. It's my struggle. It's my frustration. It's my disappointment. If you're sick, I'm sick. If you're hurting, I'm hurting. If you're in pain, I'm in pain. I'm not just going to sit here and watch you struggle. We will struggle together because I'm bearing with you. I'm bearing up your infirmities with you. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. I'm not going to go behind your back and start talking about you. You know Johnny needed $20 again. He always begging. You hear what Billy said? You know Billy be cussing. You know Billy be drinking a little bit. You know that? They got a divorce. They all, they all on social media acting like they're a perfect family. They're a perfect couple. I knew something was wrong with them. Now they divorced, see? That's why you can't be on social media front. Stop it. You get on your knees and you pray. God, give them strength. God, give them peace in the, in the troubling time. God, give them your peace and your comfort. Show them that you are God. You shut your mouth. I got to stop. My, my wife told me, she said, Brandon, stop yelling at us. <laughs> All right. I, I'm, I'm, hear my heart, Christian Faith. I'm very passionate about the Word of God. I'm not trying to yell at you. I promise I'm not. I promise you. Let me tell you something, just so you'll know. I cut people off, too. Okay, now? We good now? So God is working on me as well, okay? All right, all right. So he says, so he says bear with them. And look what it says in chapter 15. I got to hurry up. Verse 1. It says, bear with them, uh, for then we then who are strong, Lord have mercy, ought to bear with the scruples or the infirmities of the weak and not to please ourselves. Not to please ourselves. Don't do it just because it makes you feel good. Don't help me to make yourself feel better. Now, it's cool if you feel better as a result, but don't do it for that reason. 
When is the last time we helped somebody simply because they needed help? I don't want any reciprocity. I don't want anything in return. I have a sincere, honest concern for your well-being. No, I'm not looking for any accolades. I'm not looking for any acknowledgments. I'm not looking for anything but to make sure that you are okay. I'm not trying to please myself or make myself feel any better. Honestly, I already feel pretty good. I feel good about myself. I'm handsome, young, good looking. Let me stop. Then he says, then he says, make it, look at what it says. Look at what it says. Chapter 15, verse, verse, verse 2. Let us, let each of us please his neighbor for his good, leading to edification. I'm helping you for your good because it's going to build you up. It's going to strengthen you. My encouragement and my support for you is going to build you and make you stronger. And so instead of me complaining about your weaknesses, I'm going to do something about it. I'm going to encourage you when you're down. I'm going to strengthen you when you're weak. I'm going to pray for you when you fall in sin. That way you're edified and growing and getting stronger and stronger. And one day you'll be, you'll be able to go through this. One day you'll be strong enough to understand and to handle this because I'm here for you. I am here for you. All right? So I am here for you. And, and so then he says, watch this. Watch this. For even Christ did not please himself, but it is written that the reproaches of those who reproached you follow me. The insults that fell on you follow me. Help me, Holy Ghost. When they talking about you, I'm not going to let them talk about you in my presence behind your back. I'm not going to let them talk about your weaknesses behind your back. I'm going to respond to that as if they're insulting me. I know I, I understand that he's still going through the same thing. I get it. But I'm not going to let you sit here and talk about him. Okay? I got to move on. So... So I do it for sincere, I do it because I sincerely, I sincerely have a great concern for you, okay? Secondly, I do it because my concern for you looks like Christ. Jesus did not help me, Holy Spirit. Jesus did not try to please himself, but he went out of his way for you. And so whenever, help me God, listen to me. Your righteous living and your holy, upright living is not the only reflection of God that people should see. I know you live right. I know you live holy. Your skirt is down to your knees. I can't see nothing but neck and head. I get it. I understand that. And it's good for you to live holy and upright. But the second greatest reflection of God is your patience with those who don't get it right. First we live holy, and then we help those who are not as able to. My patience with you is the greatest reflection of God next to living right. The Bible says that Jesus was full of grace and truth. Full of truth and grace. Any relationship that has truth without grace is dysfunctional. Any relationship that has grace without truth is dysfunctional. Jesus was the fulfillment and the manifestation of both grace and truth. What does that mean? I'm going to tell you the truth because you need to hear the truth. And I'm going to hold you accountable to that truth. I'm going to let you know when you're wrong. I'm going to let you know when you need to go another direction. But I'm just not all truth. There's some grace for when you mess it up. So Jesus and God, help me, Holy Spirit, they have given us grace and truth. And so it is our responsibility to give each other grace and truth.
See, because mercy is compassion given to those who don't deserve it. Mercy is compassion given to those who don't deserve it. Oh, yeah, you can be nice and kind to people who you think deserve it. But your compassion looks most like God's when you give it to those who don't deserve it. When you give it to those who disappoint you. When you give it to those who insult you. When you give it to those who aren't at your level necessarily. Oh, my goodness. All right. So my patience looks like God. I'm closing with this. Closing with this. For whatever things were written before were written for our learning. That we, through the patience and comfort of the scriptures, of the scriptures, might have hope. So what he's saying is these same scriptures that we're debating, these same scriptures that we're disputing and bringing strife and bringing division, they were written for comfort. They were written for hope. They were written for peace. So I encourage you to use these same scriptures for comfort and for peace and to give each other hope. I don't care your denomination. I don't care if you're Kojic. I don't care if you're Baptist. I don't care if you're Methodist. We have our disagreements, but I'm not going to use scripture to justify my misuse of you. I'm not going to use the Bible to justify my mistreatment of you, even though we don't believe necessarily the same thing. But I'm going to use the scriptures to bring you hope, even though we may disagree. I'm going to use the scriptures to bring you comfort, even though we may disagree. I'm going to use the scriptures to bring you joy, even though we may disagree. I'm going to use the scriptures to bring you peace, even though we may disagree. I never let the scriptures separate us, but I let the scriptures bring us together because that's why they were written. Number one, number one, bear with me because I need it, not because it makes you feel good. Number two, bear with me because it's, it's like Christ. Don't be, don't be holy and mean. I, I'm going to say this. I'm coming down here. I'm going to say it. Some of us use our holiness as an opportunity to gang up on people. Some of us use our righteous living as a weapon, not against God, not against, not against the devil. We don't use our faith against sin. We don't use our faith against false doctrine. We weaponize our faith against people. I'm not talking about y'all. I'm talking about them other church folk. Uh, we got to stop weaponizing our knowledge of scriptures. We've got to stop weaponizing our knowledge of God. And we have to use it not against people, but we have to use it for people. When is the last time, we, when is the last time you didn't just pray about somebody, but you prayed for them? <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. I'm not praying about you, I'm praying for you. Even if you speak against me. Even if you will offend me, I'm not, I'm so, Lord Jesus, I'm done. I'm done. The hater message has to stop. God going to cause you to shine on your haters. Stop it. That's not my prayer concerning my haters. My prayer is that they will come to the knowledge of the error in their ways and go to God so we can shine together. God going to prove your haters wrong. No, I want God to prove my haters right when they come to the understanding and the knowledge of God. Because even though they may not like me, we still need each other. Everyone standing. Everyone standing. And I don't know where all these haters are. Who hating on us? Who, who hating on you? Where are these haters? Who's taking this much time to hate? I, don't, I, I know a lot of people, but I don't know no haters. I, I don't know none. Maybe they do, but I don't know none. 
where are all these haters coming from? A little bit, I think, of that is pride. To think that all this attention is put on you. But even if you do have all these haters, Jesus said, love those who hate you. Pray for those who, dis who spitefully misuse you. I'm not praying about you if you're my hater. I'm praying for you. Because it's all about relationship. I'm closing. I'm closing. I'm closing. It's all about relationship. That's all about relationship. God gives us, offers us relationship. We offer him religion. I said this last time, religion is not a bad thing. Because religion itself is simply just a form of worship. It simply means to worship through ritual practice. So it's not a bad thing. We all practice religion. If you are here at church right now, this is a religious practice because this is a ritual. Coming to church, giving your tithe, giving your offering, singing praise and worship, singing in the choir. If you volunteer in any capacity in church, that's religious practice. There's nothing wrong with religion itself because it's a form of worship. That's all we have to offer to God is worship. But he offers relationship. And so he won't accept our worship if we don't accept his relationship. Religion without relationship is just ritual, therefore ridiculous. Can I say that again? Religion without relationship is just ritual. That's the issue with religion is that we practice it without relationship. We come to church with no prayer life. We come to church with no fasted life. We come to church with no self-control. We come to church mean. You ushering mean? You, you greeting mean? What in the whole entire world? You, that's your job is to be nice. And so our relationship with God is seen in how we treat people. I, I know you don't have, I'm not talking about y'all. I know you don't have a relationship with God because you treat me like dirt. And therefore, your coming to church is in vain. Relation, religion without relationship with God and people is just ritual. God, help us to bear with each other. God, help us to be patient with each other. Because we need each other. You gave us each other. And so I'm talking to somebody in here today, and I'm done. I'm talking to somebody to you. If you're contemplating, if you're contemplating cutting somebody off in your life, I'm not asking you to not, I'm not asking you not to cut them off, but what I'm asking you to do is go to God first and see what God has to say about it first before we go so quick to cutting people off, so quick to giving up on people because we need each other. This church, people are coming. People are coming to this church. People are coming. And we don't want to turn them away because we don't know how to treat them. Thank you, Jesus. Lift your hands. I'm praying for you. Thank you, Jesus. I help you because you need it. I help you because it looks like Christ. And I help you because the scriptures tell me to. The scriptures reflect my behavior. Father, in the name of Jesus, God, I thank you. First of all, God, I repent. I repent for any bitterness, any lack of forgiveness that's on the inside of me, God. I repent for making rash decisions concerning my relationships without consulting you. God, I will love my neighbor from this day forward. I will love my neighbor. I will love my brother and my sister just as you've loved me. And I will be an example of your love to those who I come across. Forgive me, Lord. I repent. And from this day forward, I will bear with my brother. I will bear with my sister because we are family. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Amen.